It's already colour out there, it's just whites. I worked in America with Steve Martin and um, I died on my backside mainly because the Americans just didn't get me at all. Very dry, sarcastic humour, which is, I suppose, my tag. Um, they didn't quite get it, and yet they warned me, you know, because uh, when they said, you're working with Steve Martin, he's a bit of a legend, um, you watch his encore, and I said, oh, right, well, what's his encore? He said, well, he takes the audience out into the street and shows them how to steal a car. And I thought, wow, well, I'm sure they will accommodate me. Um, unfortunately, they didn't. I, I tried America a few times, and um, the clash of humour was there for all to see and for me to weep about on the flight home. Um, we are very unique, comedy-wise. The only time I've ever really worked abroad since the um, American hazard was really for British troops. Uh, not really tried other audiences. Um, wary that I'm very, very British. I don't think I travel well. College on the never, never. There's things you, you put up there in a pedestal. What have you done? Doing a guitar uh, banjo duet with Steve Martin must be up there. Doing a guitar duet with Brian May and, and, and other things I've done. I did a London Palladium with Robin Williams, which was comedy-wise, a real eye-opener for me because he was incredibly um, tense and, and shy until he exploded on the stage. And I have to say the same about Steve Martin. I mean, he was a painfully shy, incredibly um, uh, nice, polite person uh, and not the grey-haired nutcase you see in movies. But, you know, maybe that is the case with a lot of comedians, you know. I mean... I know some of us have got a tag of being a bit raucous or whatever, but most of us are normal guys who seem to have this um, alter ego when we, when we get up. I'm not really like that. I'm just a bloke who enjoys what I do. Uh, I get up and I'm exactly the same as I am off stage, other than the fact that I have to sort of pump it up a little bit and play the guitar. And, and for years, I've got away with it. I, I, I really don't know how other than the fact that there aren't too many people play guitar and sing fun songs. You can probably count them on one hand, you know, and with the demise of people like the Neil Innesses who we've sadly lost, um, there's fewer of us. Uh, I call us an ancient diminishing mob and that sort of sums it up. But I don't think I understand modern comedy anyway. To the children of tomorrow say you're sorry when I started, not as a kid, but when I started performing, there was definitely this north-south divide. There were the Bernard Mannings, those nightclub-y blokes who, um, you know, were incredibly racist, incredibly sexist. Uh, and um, I never, I've never played a working man's club in my life. I, I have no intention of doing so, but they feasted on that sort of a gig. Uh, and that sort of hungry audience that wanted racism and stuff. Then it tailed off. Um, and yeah, there's been some, I, I suppose, some survivors of that through the Jim Davidsons or whatever. Um, and then all of a sudden, a, a political correctness came in, which was possibly a good thing, although it was quite handcuffy to a comedian or a comedian, you know. And then, all of a sudden, I, I feel that it, it's changed again. And now, you can use C words, you can use F words, on, on TV I'm talking about, you know. And um, all of a sudden, I, I find comedy shock tactics. And I'm, I'm a, more of a storyteller, you know, and a, a little bit of a narrator of my own things, really. A bit like Connolly, who led that path for us folk entertainers way back. Um, now it just seems to, I'm going to shock you. I'm going to shock you with a word you know and you have probably used, but I'm going to use it 15 times on stage. And um, I'll give an example. One of my real heroes of comedy in recent times has been Lee Evans. And I went to see him and uh, I sat there and thinking, Lee, you're brilliant. I knew his dad, Dave, as well, you know, who was also a comedian. 
And I sat there just as a punter. Uh, and, I, and I kept saying to myself, Lee, you don't need that language. You're such a naturally, naturally funny person. And as I studied him, I sort of felt he had to mould into that O2 audience rather than them mould into him. And that was a bit of an eye-opener for me because I'm a big Lee Evans fan. But he had to actually, um, I felt, I may be totally wrong, but I felt he had to sort of change his way a bit. And that's the change in comedy is now it has to be dead street level, even with accents even, you know, and it, you know, it has to be like that, a bit like the, the music really in the Brit Awards and stuff like that. And, and so I see this, it's not so much a graph, it's more of a parabola where it's gone up, you know, Tommy Cooper and all the great comedians of our time. And, it, and then the Northern club acts who sort of became dinosaurs, whoop, and then political correctness, whoop, and then down to you can say whatever you want as long as you shock someone, um, you know, the Jimmy Cars of the world. And I've just gone along on a plateau. I look at it from afar, just like um, anyone does. I don't feel part of it. I, I feel Digence is very much what he is. Uh, and if you don't like it, don't come. Um, but all I can say is it, it's paid my bills for 53 years. So uh, I've been perfectly happy with the comedy I've been dishing out. Yeah, that's good for me, yeah. Does that work? As I was a student in Glasgow and um, having this London accent, even more London then, um, I tended to keep my mouth shut in Glasgow, as it was in those days, um, and I found my peace and tranquility and solace in the College Folk Club. Didn't know what folk music was, particularly. Um, and the Rockfield Hotel Paisley, I remember it very well, because that, you could only drink in hotels on a Sunday in Scotland in them days. And um, this bloke, there's me, a student, there's this bloke up there, never heard of him, um, Billy Connolly, but blokes bought him pints and girls chatted him up. And they were the only two reasons I was at college. And I thought, what am I doing, doing British history? You know, although history has come in handy with my act. <laughs> it was once current affairs. Um, but yeah, it, it was a light bulb moment to watch someone like Billy Connolly. And I'm talking about early Billy Connolly when he, when he, he had just these great stories to tell. He also changed his style in my book um, uh, and once again did the shock treatment. But I loved Connolly as a storyteller because there was none better. Uh, it wasn't just me he inspired, it, it was a whole movement who were a bit tired of the dinner jackets and the velvet bow ties and all that stuff. We wanted to be rebels and I think Connolly um, and possibly Mike Hardin took it into the more thinking student university circuit of which I joined uh, a few years later. But they were very, very important. They were called folk entertainers at that time. And they sort of came after sort of Jake Thackeray or whatever. And they were blending music, not a lot of it, but they were blending music with comedy. And I'd never seen anything like that before. And really, neither had the British public. Now, of course, it's uh, a little bit old and, and gone. And there are still the odd people try it, but it was so pioneering when Connolly did it, and he will always be up there for me. Is that red on full state? Uh, no, it's not. I think television has a future detached from where we are now, which is in a theatre. You see, Years ago, when I was learning, theatre and TV went arm in arm. There were summer seasons and you'd have Cannon and Ball. And this may sound rusty to a lot of people watching, but that was what comedy was. End of the pier, um, I did 13 weeks in Torquay with Davidson. And then the following year I did 12 weeks in Lowestoft, uh, or, um, Yarmouth, seemed longer. Um, but that was the way it was. So if you were big on telly, you would do your summer seasons and your tours. Now there's very little to do with theatres. I mean, top comedians won't do these theatres. You know, they want the big paydays and, and the big 
um, venues um, with the screens. And for me, that ain't comedy either. You know, comedy is this. You know, let me let me tell you something. You know, um, I <clears throat> not quite sure. I I would want to play to fifteen thousand people. I think my bank manager probably would like enjoy it, but it's not what I do. It's not what I was trained to do. And um, and I think in answer to your question, I think TV's gone one way, theatre's gone another way. And because of that, they're both struggling. Theatres are, are not full. Yeah, um, the big names won't do theatres. Um, and musically, it seems to be a lot of tribute music, once again going back in Roots or whatever. And TV, well, there was only four channels when I started on telly. And I remember being told that if you don't hit nine million, we'll terminate um, your contract. Nine million. And this year, a Take Me Out series is taken off air on peak time because it, it didn't hit two million or whatever it was. That's the difference. So when I was on telly, I couldn't bloody go anywhere. You know, even taking my girls to school, you know, on the school run, you know, I was stopped and this, that and the other because so many people would see me four times a week as well, you know, with Wednesday at eight, which I also did. Um, and now, because of the 600 channels or, or whatever, you can be really big on Dave, for example, um, but there are my neighbours who never watched Dave, um, wouldn't even probably know what it is. Uh, and so you've got big names doing those sort of channels um, and other people doing, as you say, BBC, and it just seems to be a collision course to me. Whereas when I learnt, uh, or when I began, it was television. It was just BBC or ITV, basically. Um, I started with the Beeb, uh, moved to ITV, um, was on there as, as much as I wanted to be, I think. And then um, I saw what an industry television was, and I preferred being a live entertainer with my guitar rather than the politics of television, which still exists to this day, and more so to this day, where you have one or two people that we all know who seem to govern what goes on television, you know, in including themselves. They seem to want to be on the shows themselves, you know, and we all know who we're talking about. It was never like that, you know, not Sunday Night at the London Palladium wasn't, you know, and they brought that back. I did the, the resurgence of that a couple of times, just be I did the week after Tommy Cooper died and it was spooky, you know, to stand on stage at Her Majesty's, you know. And I loved all that days of variety and I'm always mindful that I'm not sounding like a dinosaur. Um, but I can't help it because that is the comedy I knew. Um, the comedy where people had made it on telly and they took it into the theatre. I even did the good old days because I love musical music, you know. And it all seemed to be married. Now I feel TV and um, comedy especially has divorced. And I don't think people in comedy now on television will be around as long as Tommy Cooper or Morecambe and Wise, I can tell you that. Just, just put a little bit of tenor reverb, did you on that guitar? I never expected to do this in the first place. Um, I was a very late starter. I came after the Billy Connollys and the uh, Mike Hardings, you know, on the folk scene. Um, and I was heavily influenced originally by Bob Dylan and then by Ralph McTell over here. And so I was more of a singer to start with. And to go back at 70 and re, I don't know, uh, I don't know what the word is, but I've almost reinvented myself, I suppose. Um, and I'm thoroughly enjoying, um, I mean, the audiences aren't big, you know. Um, I mean, as I say, you know, I've done shows where there's St John's Ambulance people are treating people for loneliness, um, but they're big enough, you know. I mean, whereas on telly I would be playing the 2,000 seaters or, or whatever, now I, I can still pull, you know, between three and 500 and that's okay. 
um, I have no crew, I have no managers, I have no agent. People get me direct, which I like, it, it's, um, it, it's informal. And so when I wander out there, all I'm really doing is what I wanted to do in the first place, which was entertain an audience and at uh, 18, hopefully find some girls that would find my stuff funny so that I could take them for a drink. That's the only reason I started, honestly. Uh, and I failed. <laughs> um, do you want any house music as people are coming in at all? Or? Yeah, can you put something dreary on? Yeah. Comedians and comedy is very, very, very important. Um, it's weird, isn't it, when you look at someone like Trump, uh, who actually uses asides in a comedic way to put a point across. Now, I don't think many of us agree with the points, um, but I've seen it slip more and more and more into politics. Um, and, well, Johnson, uh, you, you can name them who use comedy to hit the vein of the public. So, yes, it is important. Um, are professional comedians important? I'd like to think so. Although, you can now Google and get all your jokes, you can, you can get all your stories, and you can be a performer yourself if you've got the bottle to do it. Um, people like me who write, um, we're almost a, a bit of a dying race now because you can get whatever material you want. If you want something on, you know, bright pink cauliflowers, you can Google it and get it. Um, and so it doesn't leave a lot to the imagination for a writer, of a writer. Um, so yes, I do think comedy is important because the world is miserable. I mean, it really is a miserable place to be. And, um, you know, I do worry for my grandkids, but when they come to my house, they have a bloody good time and a good laugh. Uh, and uh, I'm not even sure I'd want to be around as they get into adulthood because I don't think I'd understand the world. I don't understand it now, you know, and I'm not talking about floods and all the other stuff we've had this year. I'm, I'm talking about people. People are aggressive now, uh, angry, um, divided, tribal, and I, I never knew that as a child or as a teenager or going through my years of telly. I, I never got abuse in, in all the 17 years I did television. I never once got abuse. The only time I ever got was in America. The Washington Times um, came to see me when I was with Steve Martin and the review, which I had in my toilet, framed and blown up. The Washington Times said, you've probably never heard of Richard Dydens and you probably never will. And that was the review of me going like 3,000 miles <laughs> to get that paragraph. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.